Genesis, Genesis, and chapter 8. Genesis and chapter 8. Genesis is the very first book of the Bible. If you need a Bible, I want you to raise it. If you need a physical Bible in your hand, if you want one to take home with you, I want you to just go raise your hand, and our ushers are going to give you a Bible. That's our gift to you. You need a Bible? You need a Bible? If you need a Bible to lift up your hands, we want to give you a Bible. That's our gift to you because we believe at Bethel that every single household ought to have the Word of God. Now, now we, don't, we ain't giving you the Bible just so that you can put it as a coffee, uh, under, your, un, under your coffee. Come on, somebody. Give me your Bible because we want you to read the Word. Genesis, Genesis chapter 8, Genesis chapter 8. If you got it, say, I've got it. If you don't have it, say, wait a minute. It's the first book of the Bible, y'all. Come on, somebody. Eight chapters in, eight chapters in. We're starting right there at verse number 1. I'm going to read quite a bit of Scripture today because I want to make sure that we get the context of what's happening in Genesis chapter 8. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. I want you to read from your respective versions. The Bible reads this way. It says, but God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Somebody say receded. Receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded rapidly from the earth at the end of 150 days, the water had gone down, and on the 17th day of the seventh month, that's July 17th, y'all, on the 17th, is somebody calculating right now? Hold on, Pastor, are you right? Is it January, February, March? Oh, come on. July 17th. Come on, somebody. It said that on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountain of what, everybody? Ararat. Ararat. The waters continued to recede. Somebody say continued. continued. Y'all are seeing this thing. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month and the first day of the 10th month. That's October 1st, y'all. On the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountain became visible. And after 40 days, Noah opened a window. He had, ma- he had opened a window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven, and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could not find nowhere to perch. It could, in other words, it couldn't find nowhere to sit because there was no water over the surface of the earth, so it returned to Noah's ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark, and he waited seven more days. And again, he sent out the dove from the ark, and the dove returned to him in the evening. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak or in its mouth, there was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days. Somebody say seven days. And sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the waters had dried up from the earth. Somebody say dried up. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry by the 27th day of the second month of the earth. The the earth was completely dry. That's February 27th. Come on, somebody. It wasn't a leap year. Come on, somebody. Then God said to Noah, come out. Uh, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number. Let's go down to verse number 20 as our last verse for the day. Then Noah built an ark. I'm sorry. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds he had sacrificed, burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of the humans. Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil. In other words, even though all them ratchet. Come on, somebody. And their heart is evil from childhood. But never again will I destroy all the living creatures as I have done. 
Really, he said it in this fashion. For the next few moments, I want to preach under the simple sermonic title, It's Not a Coincidence. I want you to look at your neighbor. I know, I know y'all missed this. Come on, somebody. But look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. oh, neighbor, neighbor. It, wasn't it wasn't a coincidence. All right, now that you got good practice, go ahead and look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. I'm looking at you, Jeremiah, neighbor, neighbor. oh, neighbor, neighbor. it wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't a coincidence. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the written word. Now we ask for the living word to be able to change our lives today, God. Let it be, God, that your voice is heard, that your spirit is felt, but most importantly, that your son, Jesus Christ, is high and lifted up on today. We pray this in the master's name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated all over the building. It's not a coincidence. Because we have communion happening after the service, I don't want to keep you here until 3 o'clock. I want to see if I can get through this sermon as quickly as possible. Come on, somebody. I said as quickly as possible. I ain't making no promises. Come on, somebody. This story that we just read, the story found here in Genesis chapter 8, is a story that many people have heard about or read about, especially when you learned anything about Bible, the, the Bible or any biblical history. This is the story of Noah's Ark. The story of a man who God told him to go ahead and build this contraption, this boat, even though the civilization at the time had never seen rain before. God tells this man to build a contraption that nobody had ever seen before at a time that nobody ever thought that rain was going to come. And God said that when you build this ark, I want you to take you, your family, and anyone who believes in me to go into the ark, and when rain comes down, you'll be saved. Giving you a brief synopsis of the story, Noah preaches over a hundred years, y'all. That man was a preacher, evangelist. Over a hundred years of talking and preaching and spitting and hooping and doing everything he's got to do to get people's attention, to help them to understand who God is and what God is about to do. But even after over a hundred years of Noah preaching and doing everything that he can, the Bible says only eight people go into the ark and are eventually saved. It's a story that we've read about. It's a story that we've heard about. It's a story that many people, if I went to you, you'd be able to recite some part of the story. But today, I want to see if we can pull some new water out of an old well. This is some notes coming from my good friend, Pastor Charleston Lee. Talking to Charleston Lee, man, he helped me to see some things in the text I had not seen before. So I want to bring it to your attention. And it starts off in the very first verse of Genesis chapter 8. A verse that you might have just kind of gone through. You might have never paid attention to it, but I want to read it for you. I just want to read a snippet of that verse, the very first verse of Genesis chapter 8. And I want to see if you can catch the nuance in the text. The Bible says, but God remembered Noah. Mm. I know, I know, it don't seem like much. Come on, somebody. I mean, what are you talking about, Pastor? Why, why are you getting so excited that God remembered Noah? Is it because uh, Noah was supposed to be his favorite? Is it because God forgot Noah? No, the reason why this particular part of the text is so interesting is because the Bible says God remembers Noah, which helps us to understand that if you're only reading this from the English translation, you've missed a magnanimous point that, 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 the, that the writer is trying to communicate, which is the fact that remember doesn't mean the same remember that we know. Let me, can I break it down just for a second? I want to teach and preach a little bit. The Bible says God remembers Noah. But how can God remember if God never forgets? The Bible says God is omniscient, which means he knows everything. It says that he's omnipresent, which means he is both in our past and he is in our future at the same exact time. So how in the world could God remember Noah? Did he forget Noah? Did he forget his name? 
Then Noah turned his back. Did God turn his back on Noah? Then finally came around another 180 degrees and finally said, I remember you now. No, that's not what the text is saying. The word here in the original language is a word called zakar. And that word, unfortunately, has been translated as remembered, but it doesn't give the nuance of what the writer is trying to give. The word there, zakar, can better be translated as the word mark. M-A-R-K-E-D, marked. In other words, something, something that someone has highlighted, has, has put a specific blessing on, has, has covered. God marked Noah. When you understand what the, why the text says God marks Noah, it helps you to get up and start dancing because I need you to understand that the Bible declares that God marks Noah before the flood. God. In other words, before the flood had caused all of his damage, before all the carnage had been done, before all of the things on earth had been destroyed, God looked at Noah and he says, I'm going to set you apart. I'm going to mark you. I'm going to set you aside. I'm going to cover you. And God marks Noah so that when the trials come, Noah doesn't face the same consequences as everybody else. God. That helps you to know the kind of God that we serve, the God who loves us so much that even though we go through trials in our lives, the reason why we can stand strong is because God marked you. God sets you aside. He covered you. He put his hands over your life. And because God marks Noah, when the flood takes off, um, um, kills every animal, when the flood kills every unbeliever, when the flood breaks down every tree, when the flood destroys the entire land, Noah is able to stand because he's marked. Yeah. Woo! Believer, I don't know why y'all still stand on your seat, but y'all, when I saw that thing in the text, that thing got me excited because I realized that what God did for Noah, God does for us. Come on, somebody. That is the reason why you can go through the car accident, but you can come out unscathed. It's because God marked you. That is the reason why you can go through the same drama that everybody else went, and they took their lives, but you're still standing. It's because God marked you. God marks you in every facet of your life to make sure that you can stand strong. God marks you when life begins to beat you upside your head, when everybody else would say that, God, I'm going to quit. Life is over. I'm going to put my head down. God reminds us that he has placed his hedge of protection over our lives so that when we go through trials, we can stand. Is there anybody who can give God some praise? Because you're marked. God, God marks us. We're getting a little too happy too early. Come on, somebody. God. My wife, my wife said I look more holy when I got the robe on. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but I feel like I want to start dancing right now. He, he marks us. He marks us, church family. He marks us. He marks us the same way that he marks Noah. And he looked at Noah and he put his hedge of protection around Noah's life. That is the reason why we've come here over the last three weeks through the community initiative when people were flooding into this space and they were able to listen to the gospel and they were able to go into that pool and come back up afresh. It's because when they came back up, even though their clothes might have looked the same way, even though their situation might not have changed yet, they came up marked. And God marks us same way he marks Noah. But he doesn't mark Noah by coincidence. A couple things I want to show you in the text. If you allow me just for the next maybe 10, 12 minutes, I want to see if I can get through this as fast as possible. One of the first things we learn in the text is not only that God marks Noah, but we learn that the flood was actually in our favor. Hmm. Need somebody to hear me. Whenever we talk about the flood experience, we talk about 
the waters that destroyed all of humanity. It's always in a dismal state. We look at the flood as though it is something that was horrific, and though it was horrific in many ways because no one wanted to see, no, no one, especially God, wanted to see so many people literally lose their lives. But I need you to understand that there is a highlight in the flood. Can I, can I, can I talk about it? Understand that when God tells Noah to build the flood, he tells him to build the ark. He tells them to take the cedar wood and begin to build the planks, the decks, and he begins to build the outer shell of the ark. The Bible helps us to realize that he builds the ark on leveled ground. Somebody say leveled. He builds the ark on level ground. In other words, it takes him years and years and years to be able to construct this thing. Then he goes into this thing, and the flood happens. There's 40 days of rain, y'all, 40 days of nonstop. Y'all know what it's like in Gainesville when it rains for two days. Most cars are flooded after two days in Gainesville. And imagine the flood and waters beginning to pour for 40 days and 40 nights. And we're not talking about misty water. We're talking about torrential, to torrential rains. And after 40 days, the earth floods. And after 40 days and the earth floods, the Bible declares that the rain stops. It stops, y'all. And Noah can't see no land. So Noah sends out a raven. It was the first bird he sent out. It wasn't just a dove. Y'all read it in the text. Sends out a raven, realizes that the waters are still there. And so when the waters began to recede, somebody say recede. And Noah looked out and he saw that he was able to see a little bit here and there, but he wasn't sure of what he was looking at. The Bible says he then sends out a dove, and the dove does what the dove does. It goes out, it's looking for a branch, it's looking for a treetop, it's looking for some type of structure so that it can perch on or so that it can sit on. And the Bible declares, because the bird does not find a location for it to rest its feet, the bird comes back to the ark. He sends it out again. Somebody say again. And this time, after seven days of waiting, he sends out the dove the second time. The dove goes out, and this time, the dove sees something that's poking out of the top of the water. It's an olive tree, and so he grabs a piece of the olive tree, a branch from the olive tree, and comes back to Noah, and Noah says, it looks like the water is receding, but it can't be there yet because the bird came back. Then he waits another seven days. Somebody say seven days. I'm going somewhere with this. He waits another seven days, and he waits a third seven day. And after the seventh day, uh, the, the Bible said that he sends the bird out again. The bird goes out again. But this time, the bird realizes that there is better places for it to sleep. There's better places for it to rest its feet. So he says, I ain't going back to that dirty and noisy ark. <laughs> and when Noah sees that the bird ain't come back, he says, the waters have receded. And the Bible declares, listen to this, the Bible declares that the entire, the entire time while the ark was floating on top of the water, God was doing something specific with the ark that you may not have seen in Scripture because by the time the waters begin to recede, by the time Noah notices that the water had gone down, the Bible says that the ark lands on a mountain called Mount Ararat. Y'all read it? Come on, that was y'all part. Come on, some, you got to know that part. Of I gave that to you. It says it lands on a mountain called Mount Ararat. Why is that important, y'all? I need you to understand the reason why that's important. I did my research. Mount Ararat sits about 1,700 feet in the sky. My Ararat is not this small mountain. It's not a small molehill. It is a high mountain. And I'm asking the question, God, why in the world would you give the detail that you placed this ark on Mount Ararat? And what God had to show me is because he said, look at the beginning so that you can shout at the end. Can, can I help you to see this thing? When the ark was being built, it was on level ground. Somebody say level ground. But the flood... The flood catapulted the ark, Jesus. The flood catapulted the ark to a level that it could not get to by itself. It needed the flood in order to get up on a mountain that sits about 1,700 feet in the sky. In other words, without the flood, it would never have elevated. Without the flood, it would have never gone to the next level. 
Without the flood, it never would have gone high. What am I trying to say here? I'm saying that I understand that the flood was a, was a sense of trials. I understand that the flood shows us what turbulence looks like. I understand that the flood is a depiction of every hell that every person had had to go through. But I need you to understand that there was a purpose in the trial because the trial propelled Noah to Mount Ararat. Oh, child of God, listen to what I'm trying to say to you. In the same way that God used a flood to propel an ark that is filled with eight humans and a whole bunch of animals to get up on the mountains, it's the same way God uses your trials to elevate you to areas that you never thought you can get to. I need somebody to understand, if you're going through a trial right now, you ought to praise God for it, because while you're going through it, it might burn. While you're going through it, it might feel uneasy. While you're going through it, you might be crying, but I need you to know the end result is going to be you going to be on the next level. Mount Ararat. The Bible declares that at the end of the flood, at the end of the drama, at the end of the turmoil, at the end of the trial, when everybody else should be weeping and tears should be coming out their eyes, when they should be reflecting on what life used to look like, the Bible declares that when they look at their position, they are shocked because they are higher than where they were on today. And child of God, I need you to know your trial does have a purpose. It helps us to understand that sometimes God uses floods to manifest favor in your life. Oh God, sometimes God uses some bad things so that some good things might happen. Oh, God. Y'all, I got so many testimonies that are flooding through my brain. We've got a member right here at Bethel who I will not name. I called this member and visited this member, and this member told me that right now this member is dealing with some cancer. Cancer. Cancer is eating up their body, and they're taking, they're doing, they're doing what they got to do. They're taking the necessary precautions, doing the treatment at this moment. And I went to go visit this member, and y'all, I went there as a pastor. I got my Bible in my hands, and I'm going there so I can encourage them, only to find out that when I went in their house, they started encouraging me. I said, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. I said, how in the world? I'm talking about a member at Bethel. Come on, somebody. I said, how in the world are you encouraging me while you're going through cancer? I should be the one who should be talking to you about the love of God. I should be the one that should be lifting you up in your time of need. And they say, Pastor, the reason why I'm encouraging you is simply because I didn't even know I had cancer until God struck me with something else. Can I talk to you about it? Let me break it down. They said, I, I, I was going through a urinary tract infection, a UTI. I was dealing with that. I was dealing with a UTI, and the thing kept bothering me. And I was taking the, the medication that you got to take for the UTI, but it just wasn't working. And so finally, my wife and I said, we're just going to go to the doctor to go check this UTI out. I've been feeling good. Ain't had no other health challenges outside of the UTI. And when they, oh Jesus, when they went to the doctor, the doctor started doing all their scans and all of their tests, and it was because of the UTI that the doctor finally realized there is some cancer in your body that you didn't even know was there. Oh, child of God, why am I saying this? I'm saying this is because if you're mad about the UTI, you would have never discovered that you had cancer in your body. And sometimes what God does is he uses one thing in order to show you something different that's happening in your life so that he can elevate you. Yeah. Our trials are not without purpose, family. Your trials are not well purpose, family. It's not by coincidence that you're going through those. It's not by coincidence that you've given your life to God and all of a sudden it seems like all hell is breaking loose all over your life and things seem like it's getting worse. It's not by coincidence that it feels like you've made the best decision, but it feels like the worst decision because the devil is slapping you upside your head. It's not by coincidence that you made the declaration that you were going to open up the word of God and read the word of God, but all of a sudden all the distractions came. You started falling asleep. Kids started calling you. People who ain't never said your name started saying your name. 
It's not by coincidence, y'all. It's not by coincidence. And what God does is he uses floods to manifest favor in our life. Can I just say something real quick? This also helps me to realize that God doesn't just use floods to manifest favor in your life. But it also helps me to realize that, that's why you can't cover somebody else's blessings. Let me pause right here and just say this. That, that's why, covet, let me, use, let me stop using these churchy language. Come on. That, that, that's why you can't hate on other people. That, that's why you can't look at what somebody else have and, and start to think to yourself, I wish I had that to the point where your heart begins to get hard, um, um, hard as a rock. That's why you can't, why, why, why am I saying this? It's because, listen to this, in order for Noah and his family to have gotten on Mount Ararat, they had to go through 40 days and 40 nights of a flood. And if you ain't willing to go through a flood, don't cover the person's mountaintop. Y'all ain't listening back to me. Jesus. Some of you right now, you're saying, Pastor, man, I seen brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. They was booed up in the corner. I know they've been married so long, and I want to boo just like them. Come on, somebody. I want to live a life just like them. But you have no idea the hell that they've had to go through in order to get to where they are. Don't covet somebody else's blessings because if you're not willing to go through the burdens that they had to go through, don't covet the blessings that they have now. Y'all, y'all, let me, I, I know, I know, I know, I'm, I'm way past my point, man, but I'm reminded, man, of the Shaolin monks. Y'all remember, y'all know the Shaolin monks? Shaolin monks, man, are these, are these group of individuals, this group of individuals who have trained their body at such a high degree, a high temperature, a high level, to where their bodies are able to do things that the average normal body is not able to do. One of the things I was looking at as, a, as an article where a Shaolin monk, uh, a, a facility that they were at, the Shaolin monks had a tree that sat right dead smack in the middle of the facility, and it had all of these holes in the tree. And the reporter is going around taking pictures of this tree. And they said, how in the world did all these holes come? Because I know y'all ain't got no drills. And he said, no, in order for the Shaolin monk to be able to train their senses and train their body, the Shaolin monk has to take their finger and they have to continually poke at the tree. Poke at the tree. Even though the skin on their finger bursts and it begins to bleed, they have to poke at the tree. Poke at the tree. Even though the callus begins to build, they have to poke at the tree. And poke at the tree. Even, even though their bones begin to splinter and it begins to heal again, they have to continue to poke at the tree until their finger is like a bullet. And the reporter, before he started the interview, he said, man, I wish I could be just like y'all. I wish I could fight just like y'all. I wish my body was just like y'all. And listen, what he found out is if you want to be just like the Shaolin Shaolin monks, you've got to go through the stuff that they've gone through. You don't just get to the mountaintop without a flood. Come on, somebody. You don't just get to better without going through bitter. Let me, let, me, let me just continue because I know I ain't got that much time. Y- y'all, it shows us, the, tr- the text shows us that not only does God mark it, it shows us that the flood is actually in our favor. But here's what it also shows us. It shows us that o- obedience is important. Amen. Somebody say obedience. obedience. I, w- I want to I I talk about this. And if, listen, when you go home, I really want to sit there and read and go through all the intricacy, but I don't want to go past my time. Listen, I want, when you go home and you're watching this online, I want you to look at chapter 8 and read verses 13 through 18. I want you to look at how this thing begins to flow. In verse 13 through 18, it helps us to understand that, like, literally, man, the floods, have, the waters have receded. The waters had receded. And the Bible says, at this point, the grounds are dry. Let, let, me, let me go back. I got to read this. Thing. I gotta be, can y'all look at me and be like, I'm playing. Hold on, man. Some of y'all got, some, some of y'all got some beady eyes out there. Y'all just saying, Pastor, I don't know. I don't know about what you're saying right now. The Bible says, here it is, verse 13. It says, by the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then, the water had dried up from the earth. Y'all see that? Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. Somebody say dry. This was what time? This was the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year. In other words, this was January 1st on Noah's birthday of, well, not birthday, but uh, at the time when he was 601 years old. Y'all see that? 
Verse 14, it says, by the 27th day of the second month. In other words, the earth had dried up, and he saw with his own eyes on the first day of the first month, which is January. But listen to verse 14. 14 says, by the 27th day of the second month. Next month, at the end of next month, which is the end of February, the Bible says by the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Somebody say completely. In other words, everything had gone back to the most normal that it can possibly go back to. But listen to right here in verse 15. It says, then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature with you and the birds and the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground so that they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number. So, verse 18, Noah came out. What am I showing you? I'm showing you that the Bible declares that months prior, in July and in October, the water started to recede. Y'all can tell it's been a while because now it's January 1, and it says on January 1, everything looked dry. Matter of fact, it's not just that everything looked dry, everything was dry, and when Noah himself looked out of the ark, he said, it's dry. January. So if everything is dry in January... Why does Noah wait until after February to come out the boat? Let me, can I paint this picture for you? Because, man, some of y'all are so spiritual. Y'all done read this text, man. Y'all think about veggie tales. Let me just say this. While Noah and his family was in the ark, it was nothing like the cartoon suggests. They were with animals, y'all. Anybody ever been around animals? Roaches don't count. Come on, somebody. Anybody been around animals? Come on, somebody. Animals have to eat, but they also have to defecate. Ooh. Animals are stinky. Not only are animals stinky, but these are all type of animals, herbivores and, and carnivores. And these animals are rowdy in the boat. Not, it's, I'm saying this because I want you to understand the atmosphere in which Noah and his family were living in for months. Loud, rowdy animals, smelly, stinky animals, and they just couldn't sit up in their, in their high suite and not deal with them. No, they had to take care of all the animals every single day to make sure that they were fed, to make sure they can take out all the doo-doo, to make sure that life was good for them. By now, y'all should be okay knowing that pastor says doo-doo on stage. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and for months, they are in the boat. For months, they're going through stress. They never had a peaceful night, y'all. How do I know this? I know they never had a peaceful night because some animals are nocturnal. Anybody ever owned a bird before? Y'all, listen, the only time birds shut up is when you put, literally put a cover over their face so they can't see themselves or anything around them. Because they will literally make noise all throughout the night. Some animals are nocturnal, like owls, where it's in the night that they wake up and they're energetic. No peace. And if you're like me, if you're like Noah, the, the thought has to cross your mind, when, oh when, will I be able to get out of here? When, oh when, will I be able to finally go on ground and build my house and live my life? When will life be better? So on the first day of the first month, when Noah sees that the, that the ground is dry, he sees it with his eyes, y'all. I don't know about you, but I would have been like Forrest Gump. <laughs> this, this, I, 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 I'm not going to go out when there's water. Come on, somebody. You know, I'm, I'm black. I can't swim. I can't swim. Come on, somebody. I would have drowned. Come on. After being saved. But if I saw dry ground, I would have been like Forrest Gump, and I would have started running and being happy because finally I can get away from these animals. But the Bible says even after he's seen that the, dry, that the ground was dry, he still waited. He waited. And on the 27th day of the second month, which is February 27th, the Bible says that the earth was completely dry. And they're still in the boat. Why are they still in the boat? Have you ever asked that question? Why are they still in the boat? Because in the, in the cartoons, it says that once, the, it shows that like once the waters go down, they just get out the boat and everything is happy. But y'all, this is not cartoon. This is real life. They're still in the boat. Why are they still in the boat? Can I answer the question for you? Because the reason, oh, the whole reason 
why God instructed the flood to strike the earth in the first place was because man, in other words, humanity, was doing everything they thought was right. And because they thought, because every, they were doing everything they thought was right, God said, I've got to literally wipe this thing out and start from scratch. So literally, now that the flood is over, if Noah would have left the ark, even seeing that the ground was dry, but had not first gotten the instruction from God, he would have just been doing the very thing that God had literally flooded the earth for. Can I help you out, family? Amen. Noah waited until God spoke. Amen. God, God. Oh, I want you to see this thing. The ground is dry. Everything is looking good. Noah is saying in his heart, <laughs> I want to get out of this thing. I want to finally live my life. But the Bible declares that Noah does not lay a foot on the ground until God speaks. Y'all, why is that important for us on today? I need you to understand that the lesson of obedience that Noah is trying to teach us is that as children of Jesus, we've got to wait until Jesus speaks before you make a move. For some of us, can I, let me contextualize this thing. For some of us, man, like opportunity looks bright on the other side right now. Come on, somebody. Right now, the job is calling your name. Right now, she's perking up her hips, and she's calling your name right now, and you want her to be your new boo thing. Right now, it looks like you have an opportunity to pay all of your bills. Right now, it looks like life can get better if you just make this decision. But y'all, if you make the decision without first hearing from God, you're falling back in the same trap as the antediluvians from the beginning. So Noah sees a good opportunity, but he waits on God. He can smell the fresh air, but he waits on God. And the reason that is something that you ought to hear, child of God, is because when you wait on God and you wait on God's instruction, God will instruct you to move at the most opportune time. In other words, when God tells you to move, he tells you to move at the right time when your first step is going to collide with the best opportunity that will ever happen in your life. Let me say it this way. For some of you, you might have gone through a breakup. You know how it happens, man. You break up with one person, and you get on the market, and you start getting all type of random DMs. Come on, somebody. You're walking through the mall or walking through the street. People just giving you some compliments. For some of you, maybe you might not have heard the compliments, but the compliments are there. And they want to be the next person around your arms. Come on, somebody. But family, if you move before God moves, you'll find yourself in the same relationship that you just got broken up from. When God tells you to move, he tells you to move at the right time. He perfectly times it so that when you move, he has the person that you need to collide with your life, the provision that you need to collide with your life, the thing that you've been hoping for to collide with your life. He times it in such a way where life absolutely gets better. Yeah. Yeah. Family, we can never experience the blessings of God unless we move like he moves. Here's my last point, and I'm going to sit my blind down. The text does not only show us that Noah's marked, it doesn't just show us that the flood is in your favor. It doesn't just show us that obedience is important. But the text shows us that it's not by coincidence. I want you to notice in verse 20, after Noah sees that the ground is dry, and God gives him the instruction in his family to come out, he says, take all the animals out so that they can start populating. Because they, they happy, y'all. They happy. Happy. And he wants them to be fruitful and multiply. So all of them are trying to find a corner of the earth where they can begin to bear some fruit. But I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse 20. That when Noah and his family comes out of the ark, this, I mean, y'all, like, they've been waiting for this day to happen. They've been waiting to finally put their feet on dry ground. And y'all, I want you to understand that it is not like they walk into paradise. Because the aftermath of everything that has just transpired is still sitting on the ground. 
there's still dead carcasses on the ground. The trees are broken and they're laying on the ground. Structures that were built before the ark was built are now laid in waste on the ground. But the Bible says they step out of the boat, man. Y'all, let me just say this, man. If the animal's about to be fruitful and multiply. Let me talk. I'm, I'm going to be fruitful and multiply. Come on, somebody. But the Bible says, listen to this, y'all. Verse 20, verse 20. It's right there, verse 20. The Bible says that when they step out of the boat, the first thing that Noah does, before he looks for the prime real estate, before he finds a corner for him and his wife to consummate, before he does anything, the Bible says the first thing that he does is he builds up an altar, grabs a few of those clean animals, and the Bible says he worships God. Y'all, I know this don't seem like a big point until you understand the context. The reason why Noah builds an altar and he worships God is because he realized that the reason my life is still intact, the reason why I'm still breathing right now, it's not by coincidence. It's because I've got a God in heaven who looked, who sat high but looked low. I've got a God in heaven who loved me so much that he protected me and shielded me and provided for me and brought me to this place in my life. The only reason why I'm still standing is because of Jehovah. And it says before I can do anything for myself, I'm going to worship God. And I'm going to give him everything I've got because it's not by coincidence that I'm here. Do I have two or three believers in the room on today who can worship God? Because it's not by coincidence that you're sitting in the pews on today. It's not by coincidence that you're in the church. It's not by coincidence that you've given your life to Jesus. It's not by coincidence that you're still breathing. The Bible says, let every Everything that has breath, praise ye the name of the Lord. In other words, if you still got breath in your lungs, you ought to open up your mouth and praise God right here. If you got strength in your legs, you ought to start jumping and give God some praise right here. If your arms still work, you ought to swing them in the air and give God some praise right here because it was not by your might or by your strength that you were standing here today. It's not by coincidence that your children are still breathing. It's not by coincidence that you didn't go into the grave. It's not by coincidence that your mortgage was paid, that food is in your refrigerator, that you got shoes on your feet. It's not by coincidence. It's because of Jesus. Can you give God some praise right here? Because Jesus is good. Jesus is good. It's not by coincidence that your tuition is paid. It's not by coincidence that you came back unharmed from spring break. It ain't by coincidence that you ain't caught HIV or chlamydia. It's because of Jesus. Noah says, I know I got the opportunity to do anything else. But God, If it wasn't because of you, Jesus, I wouldn't be here on today. If it wasn't because of what you did, I would not be here on today. Y'all, I'm thankful because while I may not have been on Noah's ark, I praise God because of the sacrifice that he made over 2,000 years ago. The Bible declared that Jesus, because he loved every last one of us, he went up on a cross called Calvary. The Bible said they stretched him wide and put nails in his head. They put lashes on his back. They spit at him and laughed at him. But Jesus stopped dying just to forgive all of our sins because the Bible says he looked at us and said, Father, forgive them, forgive us, forgive y'all. Forgive me because we have no idea what we're doing. And because he died on Friday, rested on Saturday, and woke up early on Sunday morning, I can give God some praise. It's not by coincidence that I'm saved on today. Somebody ought to give God some praise right here. It ain't by coincidence, y'all. 
It ain't by coincidence. You might think life is just happenstance. You think it was by coincidence that God brought you here today? You think it's by coincidence that you're celebrating the communion? Let me tell you, the communion is simply just a big old symbol of what Jesus did on Calvary. It reminds us that in the same way that the bread is broken, it's the same way that Christ's body was broken. In the same way that we drink the unfermented wine, it is a symbol of the blood that flowed from Calvary's cross. And it still works on today to give me the remission of my sins. It's not by coincidence that I'm here. It's because God had a plan for my life. Yes, sir. Yes. I need somebody to hear me on today. If by chance you thought that you were here by chance, I'm here to let you know. I'm not here by chance. God brought you here. God loves you so much that he saw all the knucklehead stuff you've been doing in your life. He says, I'm going to love you through it. You ain't been following everything I told you. I know you have it. Like the elder said earlier, listen, if you're perfect, you might as well go ahead and flap your wings and go to heaven now. But the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every last one of us have sin penetrating through our veins. But God says, if you just claim my righteousness, I'll swap out your sins to be saved in me. It's not by coincidence, y'all. This is what we call the doctrine of salvation. You are saved in Christ through faith going to explain that. That means if you believe that Jesus, I ain't talking about Jesus died for everybody else. Make it personal. Say it's me. It's me. If you believe Jesus died for me. And the Bible says confess with your mouth, believe with your heart, and you shall be saved. Every head is, no, everyone standing to their feet right now. Everyone standing to their feet right now. I'm done. I went past what I was supposed to go past. But y'all, the reason why I felt like we had to go and stretch a little bit further because I need somebody to realize that God loves you with an everlasting love. He loved you so much that even before you were born, he literally created a plan to save your life. He loves you so much, present tense, that he'll look past all the drama and trauma that you're going through, every bad decision that you're making right now in hopes to search after you and bring you back to him. He loves you. Which is why I can declare today, it's not by coincidence that you're here. It's not by coincidence. And someone who's listening to me right now, saying, Pastor, I hear you. I hear you. I, I, need, I, need some, I need some prayer because there's something, there's this battle that I have been dealing with in my life. And I, and I know God has been calling me to greater. I know God has been calling me to do something different. I know God has been calling me to be his own. But I've been fighting with something. The devil has been telling me I'm not good enough. The devil has been telling me, man, don't give your life today because you've been walking up to the altar every single week and you're still the same devil. The devil have been telling me the reason why I can't believe in you on today is because I know I'm going to mess up on tomorrow. But Jesus Christ, right now, shut the mouth of the enemy. Because I believe there's somebody under the sound of my voice who wants to finally make the declaration, Jesus, I want you to be Lord over my life. Can I just tell you what that means? That simply means, Jesus, I want you to be the master over my life. Help me to understand which way to go. Feed me. Console me. Protect me. Provide for me. Do what a good father does for their children. I want you to be Lord and Savior. And if that's you, I want you to stretch your hands up right now. Lord and Savior. Right now, I see you. I see you. 
I see you. This ain't the time to be looking at your neighbors. This is the time to make this thing personal. Your neighbors ain't the reason you're here today. It's because of Jesus that you're here on today. Hands are down. There's somebody who's saying, not Jesus, I don't want you to just be Lord over my life. But I've been hearing you. And you've been making the call over my life to finally make that declaration. Go through this water and be saved. If that's you, I want you to put your hands up right now. You want to be baptized. Just a big word. You want to bury your pain. That's just a big word. You want Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. You recognize that it's not by coincidence that you're here. So you're going to give everything you have to the one who's responsible. And that's Jesus. Where your hands at? You want to be baptized? You want to start some Bible studies because you want to be baptized? You've been fighting this thing. I know you're here. I know you're here. You've been fighting this thing. But Jesus says, remember, it's because I love you so much. It's because I died for you. It's because I paid the sacrifice. Not Pastor Eddie, but Jesus. That's your hero today. And if that ain't the biggest example of love, I don't know what is. He's betting on the fact that if you would just see how much he loves you, you'll finally choose him. If you're watching online, you want to give your life to Jesus right now. Right now in the chat, in the link, there's a link called Next Steps. I want you to just go ahead and click on that link right now. Just three or four brief questions. I want you to fill that out, fill your information in. And it's going to start you on your journey, man. We're going to get you some Bible studies if you're not in Florida, we're in Gainesville, Florida. If you're not in Florida, man, it don't matter where you are. We will find a church for you to get baptized in so that you can give your life to Jesus. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If you're here as I'm praying, and you need to make that call. And listen, eyes are closed, heads are bowed right now. This is a personal decision. A personal decision. If you're here, even as I'm praying, lift your hands up. What if our Bible workers are going to put a card in your hand? That's just to get some information so that we can get with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis and start you on this journey. Father God, right now, I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you, Jesus, that before trials begin to develop in our lives, you marked us. I thank you, Jesus, that you used the trial in our lives to propel us to greater Jesus. God, I thank you for the fact that you have not stayed silent in our lives forever, but God, you speak. So God, if you would just follow your words, we would live the best life that we've ever had. But more than anything, Jesus, I thank you for the fact that it was not by coincidence that we're here. You've been loving up on us even when we've turned our backs on you. You've been forgiving us even when we've hesitated to forgive others. Jesus. You've been providing for us in ways that we know and also in ways that we have no idea about. You've kept us standing even when the gates of hell have tried to take our lives. And for that, God, we worship you on today. We praise you on today. We give you glory on today. Because it's not by coincidence that we're here. But for the individuals, God, who have made that declaration, and Father God, they want you to be their Lord and their Savior. They need your help. They need your help to break the chains that has been holding them down. They need your help, God, to propel them into the next level of their life. God, where they can experience you on a level they've never seen or ever felt before. For the person that said they want to bury their pain, Jesus, and they want to come up afresh, a brand new creature in Jesus Christ. 
whether they're here personally or watching us online.